Uh, so, <clears throat> my old PhD supervisor, Jordan Pollock, told me that uh, good old-fashioned AI programmers, in particular Lisp programmers, used to have an adage that was, if it's worth doing at all, it's worth doing recursively. So if you had a good idea about how to do a problem faster, then it would be a good, better idea to do it recursively. And basically, this talk is about how to do evolutionary processes in a recursive fashion, and whether biology can do that, and how to make sense of it. Uh, so we've seen um, a lot of discussion about the relationship between evolution and learning that we can view evolution as an adaptive process that improves a solution with experience. Uh, and we've also heard a lot of talk about the evolution of evolvability, which we might call learning to learn, or an adaptive process that improves its ability to improve a solution with experience. Now, an algorithm that learns how to learn is a type of learning algorithm, which is just to say that the evolution of evolvability is still evolution. So it's a little bit, it's easy to get those two ideas confused, I think, but they are different ideas. The kind of question that you'd ask if you're thinking about it in the first way is, well, that different mechanisms or model spaces are different learning algorithms. I wonder which one evolution is using. Right? But if you think about it in the second way, it, the, quest, the relevant question is, what sort of model space allows movement in the space of evolutionary processes? Uh, so what's the space of evolutionary processes? Well. Uh, biological evolution is sometimes characterized as a Darwinian machine incorporating the fundamental components of heritable variation and reproductive success. So we have a population of genotypes with variation. They produce a distribution of phenotypes. Some of those phenotypes get through the sieve of selection, and the ones that do get reproduced. Fine. But we know that none of those mechanisms are fixed in natural processes. The distribution of phenotypic variation changes over evolutionary time uh, as a result of the evolution of developmental interactions, the evolution of the genotype-phenotype map. And the uh, selective pressures on individuals change as a result of the evolution of ecological interactions between species. And even the identity of the evolutionary unit changes over evolutionary time as a result of the evolution of new reproductive strategies or new mechanisms of inheritance or genetic variation processes. These two might, you might be okay with, sort of evolution of GP map, evolution of niche construction. And this one might be a little bit more unfamiliar. So this, I'm talking about things like uh, traits that modify whether two genes are co-dispersed or whether two individuals are co-dispersed, whether a parasite is transmitted horizontally or vertically, compartmentalization, changes in genetic linkage, the evolution of fair meiosis, homologous recombination, transposable elements, etc., etc. All of those things have effects on the evolutionary unit, the definition of the evolutionary unit. So what can change in the Darwinian machine? Well, genetic or developmental structures can change the distribution of phenotypic variation. The evolution of social or ecological interactions changes the nature of selection on the phenotypes. And the evolution of reproductive structures changes the genetic variation or heritability of genetic combinations. So let's understand all of that. <clears throat> OK, so that means that the products of evolution modify the processes of evolution. Or put another way, the Darwinian machine is self-referential. That circular causation, people are talking about it in particular in the fields of the interaction between evolutionary processes and developmental processes, such as uh, it's clear that some organisms are more evolvable than others, but can that evolvability absolutely be adapted? Uh, it causes a headache when you think about it that way. It causes a headache because you think about the Darwinian machine as a fixed process, but we need to think about it as a process that changes. In the interaction between evolution and ecology, a good example is that organisms certainly modify the niche in which they live, but can they modify it in a way which has systematic effects on the niche in which they live? For example, to increase ecological homeostasis or self-regulation, or are they just as likely to fuck it up? Uh, so the kind of questions which are burning issues in, in Evo Devo and Evo Eco are, are essentially caused by the circular causation that's implied in evolutionary processes. I think more importantly, Evolution without self-referential mechanisms can't explain changes in the level of the evolutionary unit, which are characteristic of biocomplexity writ large. I'm talking about the major transitions in evolution, uh, where um, the Darwinian machine was originally instantiated in nothing more than self-replicating molecules in the primordial soup, and latterly in self-replicating molecules in compartments, and latterly in simple cells and eukaryote cells with organelles from a bacterial origin, and from single-celled organisms to multicellular organisms, and from multicellular solitary organisms to eusocial insects. 
in each of those transitions, entities that were capable of independent replication before the transition can replicate only as part of a larger whole after the transition. I'm quoting Maynard Smith and Seth Mary there. And we don't know how uh, um, selection at one level of organization is suppressed and heritable variation at another level of organization is created. So I want to know, how does the evolution of development modify processes of phenotypic variation? How does the evolution of ecological relationships modify the processes of selection or the shape of selection? And how does the evolution of reproductive mechanisms modify inheritance? And how do those three components work together in the evolutionary transitions and individuality such that the Duinian machine is reinstated at a new level of organization? I should be able to do that in 20 minutes, right? Um, so here's my take on what the hard questions are here. This is my controversial slide. Uh, make sure you've pissed everybody off and got their attention before we move on. <clears throat> so, uh, you don't understand anything in biology if you don't understand evolution. Hopefully we'd all agree with that. But I would say you don't understand evolution at all unless you understand the evolution of evolvability. And moreover, you don't understand the evolution of evolvability at all unless you understand how the Darwinian machine reinstates itself at multiple scales of biological organization. Only then would we have an explanation for how biological complexity arose. Because if we only had a Dominion machine operating on the level of self-replicating molecules in the primordial soup, all we would have <coughs> is good self-replicating molecules in a soup. So here's a little map. So can I, can, can yeah. I replace the word levels with timescales? They are definitely related. Yeah. Uh, but it's not just a matter of looking at the same microevolutionary processes over different timescales to see macroevolutionary processes. That's the, that's the whole issue of whether macroevolution is just more microevolution, right? Uh, so here's a map of the different models that I'm going to talk about. Um, a model of the evolution of development that modifies interactions between components within a unit of selection. That, model, that modifies the distribution of phenotypic variation. A model of the evolution of sociological interactions or interactions between multiple component, uh, evolutionary units that changes the selection pressures on each other. And the evolution of reproductive inheritance mechanisms that changes the heredity, whether things are selected together or not. And altogether, that's supposed to help us understand the evolutionary transitions in evolvability, in individuality. Um, so, you know, maybe that's a little overambitious. Uh, but I want to give you a sketch of some of the work that I've done in those different areas. I would have more detail on the first one because it's the most well-developed and it's the easiest to understand. The second one is quite easy to understand after you've seen the first one. The third one is a little bit tricky. And then at the end, I'll try and pull that together to say, well, actually, there's really something very simple going on here. Simple but important. So how can learning theory help us here? Well, machine learning characterizes how a computational process can improve over time as a function of past experience, including its own past behavior, importantly. How can machine learning principles possibly be relevant to natural evolution? Well, a lot of machine learning is about building models uh, that represent data or past experience. Uh, and in a lot of cases, it's simply a case of incrementally improving the fit of that model to the data. And incremental improvement is something that natural selection can do. So the issue then becomes where the natural selection has suitable heritable variation that can represent an appropriate space of models to do good learning. Uh, so let's very, take a very, very simple way of thinking about different classes of models. First of all, we could do uh, a learning process that didn't have a model at all. So we treat each hypothesis as though it's atomic. It doesn't have any internal structure. Uh, we can uh, change our confidence in one hypothesis or another hypothesis, but we can't generate any new hypotheses. Uh, a simple type of model is a univariate model where we treat each variable as though it's independent. We know it isn't really. There's complex structured dependencies between the variables, but this kind of model couldn't represent them. Uh, if you didn't like that, you could move up a little bit, just a little bit to a bivariate model that's capable of representing correlations. It's the minimal form of interaction structure that you could want from a model. And then beyond that, there's all sorts of multivariate models you could be thinking about. How's that relevant to evolutionary processes? Well, the first is genotype selection, where you treat a genotype as though it's just an atomic thing you can't decompose. Some genotypes are better than others. Some genotypes increase in frequency in the population. Some go down in the population. We've seen lots of people formalizing that. The second one is allelic selection. Some alleles increase in frequency in the population. Other alleles decrease in frequency in the population. There might be epistasis between them. There might be frequency dependence between them. But uh, 
uh, selection on allele frequencies can't model that. It, all you get is the additive effects. A bivariate model, I think, is the minimally interesting case. And it has sufficient roots in the higher order models. So correlations are a sufficiently interesting kind of model space. That's why the perceptron is a sort of minimal interesting kind of learning. And Lairs and uh, Vitaly Feldman have shown us earlier in the week that natural selection can do correlation learning, or more formally, correlational statistical query learning. OK, I'll put that in earlier in the week. Uh, it can do that if in, only if there's heritable variation that affects correlations. So if you have some way of representing correlations, then you could select on them. Uh, and then uh, selection would have a representation of the correlations. But it's sort of clear that there are many examples where evolution does have heritable variation that can affect correlations. So a regulatory interaction between one gene and another gene affects the, ex the correlation of the expression of those two genes. OK, so the first model, the evolution of development. Uh, there's been a number of different models uh, with Hod Lipson and Kashtan and Alon uh, and uh, various others. Uh, also in the population genetics literature, uh, where you represent a genotype phenotype map of some kind with a matrix of correlations. <clears throat> uh, we can think of this as a matrix of gene regulatory interactions. The entries in that matrix are going to tell us whether gene number one upregulates or downregulates gene number six, et cetera. Uh, we're also going to evolve a genotype vector, which is sort of the direct effects of uh, the genotype on the phenotype. And then the phenotype is going to be the multiplication of the two. Uh, but um, diverging a little bit from a lot of models that other people have done, uh, that's going to be a recurrent process. So those two things give us the phenotype at time step one. Uh, then we put the phenotype through the matrix again. It gives us the phenotype at time step two and so on until we get an equilibrium. That's the adult phenotype. So we have a developmental process that unfolds over time. Uh, okay. Um, notice that I'm not learning an input-output classification here. I'm just, just going to select for good phenotypes. I'm going to select for a matrix and a vector that gives me a phenotype which is fit, not a matrix that does a mapping between an input and an output. Um, so I'm going to select for two different phenotypes. If I select for just one phenotype, it's sort of redundant to evolve a genotype phenotype map that just produces one phenotype, right? You could do that with a straight through one to one genotype phenotype map. There has to be at least two things that you want your genotype phenotype map to represent. Uh, so let's have two uh, phenotypic targets, which uh, in, in, uh, technically just means I'm going to select for a particular pattern of gene expression levels in two different environments. Um, so which pattern of expression levels shall I choose? Uh, well, without loss of generality, I may as well have a well-known phenotype in environment one um, and a, another well-known phenotype in environment two, but perhaps slightly less well-known. That's a picture of Donald Hebb of uh, Hebbian learning fame. Um, so the expression levels of the uh, 200 pixels, uh, 200 genes, are selected to produce a picture of, of Darwin in one environment and produce a picture of Hebb in the other environment. Um, it's important to realize that at any one time, selection is only acting on the ability to produce one of those phenotypes. It's not tested on its ability to produce the distribution of two phenotypes. But I'll, of course, be interested in whether it does. There's something subtle there that I might come back to later a little bit, that I'm going to select for a good phenotype, which is going to imply selection of a genotype phenotype map that's capable of giving me a, a good P. But I'm not actually selecting for a particular genotype phenotype mapping. Uh, I'm just selecting for a good phenotype. So what happens? Well, um, over evolutionary time, I'm switching back and forth between these two environments. And some of the regulatory interactions are becoming more positive, some of the regulatory interactions are becoming more negative, and some of them are going up in one environment and down in the other environment. If I look at the pattern of positives and negatives and neutrals, uh, makes a pattern. Uh, is that a good pattern? Well, if I um, were to train a particular kind of neural network to form an associative memory of those two patterns using Hebb's rule, uh, it would do exactly the same thing, right? So basically all it says is that if two uh, elements of the um, phenotype vector are both expressed high or both expressed no, low, you increase, selection is going to increase the regulatory interaction between them. But if one is selected high and the other is selected low, then the regulatory interaction which decreases the correlation between them or uh, downregulates them one another is going to be uh, selected for. But that's the same as Hebb's rule, uh, which is just neurons that fire together, wire together. 
Uh, and the type of network that it's equivalent to, because the equations that are wrote down were the same, uh, is a hot field network, which is just a fully recurrent uh, neural network, all the neurons connected to everything else. So it's sort of obvious that a gene network can behave like a hot field network because they have the same equation of motion. But what's not so obvious is that the change in regulatory interactions in a gene network over evolutionary time are the same as the changes in synaptic connections in a neural network as a result of the application of Hebb's rule. So that's what this shows. Uh, so what does that mean? Well, now, now that I've evolved a genotype-phenotype map that was switching back and forward between these two environments, now I have a genotype-phenotype map which is capable of producing a phenotypic distribution with two attractors. Uh, one is a picture of Hebb and the other is a picture of Darwin. Uh, there's a few screwy ones, but it's pretty good. So the evolved regulatory interactions have attractors that correspond to the two targets that have been selected for in the past. So a single gene network can remember more than one phenotype. That means it's the sort of minimal case of, of non-trivial memory, right? If you're just going to remember one thing, uh, then that's no more a memory than saying, if I put the chair in the corner of the room, the chair will remember the position where I put it, right? But if you wanted something to remember two things, you have to be able to learn correlations, and that's what this gene network is doing. Uh, you can do some cool, thing, cool things with the gene network that behaves in this manner. So I can give it a genotype vector that looks uh, a little bit like, oh, sorry, looks like a part of uh, Heb, and the expression uh, percolates through the regulation network to give me back a complete picture of Heb. Or I can give it a little bit of Darwin, and over developmental time, it gives me a full picture of Darwin. So development can reproduce a complete phenotype from a partial genotype. Uh, also, I could give it an input vector that looks like head, or an input vector that looks like Darwin, and I can change the input vector linearly, proportionally, from one to the other, so that in the middle here I have things that are exactly halfway between head and Darwin. But the response of the network, the adult phenotypes produced, go head, uh, got it wrong. Yes, got it right. Head, 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 Darwin, 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 Darwin. So there's a very sharp uh, transition uh, between the two attractors that are developed in the system. We can also do generalization with it. So development can produce novel phenotypes that are new combinations of learned features. So here, instead of evolving to two targets, I'm evolving to a set of eight, which have some modular variation in them, inspired by Kashtan Nalon's work on modularly varying environments. We can interpret this as a, uh, a picture of a, an RNA loop, an RNA stem, or a wing and a halt hair, if you like. Uh, but there's some combinations of loops and stems which have been selected for in the past. And now let's look at the distribution of phenotypes that are produced by the evolved network. It's capable of reproducing all eight of those, but it also produces some other phenotypes that were not selected for in the past, such as four halt hairs or four wings. So those are now, in a sense, uh, mutational neighbors of one another. Uh, they're generalizations of features which have been uh, selected for in the past, but they're not, com they're not that particular combination of features was never selected for in the past. Can you say what was tweaked to get the additional states on the lower block? Uh, so the gene network is, is evolved over time to one of these, and then you change it random to another one, and you change it random to another one. And then I randomize to test what's evolved, to test what the attractors of the gene network are. I randomize the genotype vector and see what its attractors are. Uh, OK, so what do we conclude from that? Gene networks evolve like neural networks learn. Gene networks can store and recall multiple phenotypic patterns that have been selected for in the past. And they can also generalize to novel phenotypes that are from the same family. So I'm using family in the sense that Kashtan and Alon use it. So, kind of, uh, the, so, uh, so the, the gene part is going changing on a faster time scale than the matrix, yeah. which is sort of the network structure part. Yeah. Yes, that's true. Uh, and is that crucial if I had them on somewhat simpler time scales? Yes, it is. If the gene network evolved too quickly, then it would just fit to a, a network that produced one phenotype. And then when you changed environments, it would just evolve back to produce that one phenotype. It's important that it's on a separate time scale. And you were right to mention the different time scales at the start. Uh, so the fact that the selective pressures on gene regulatory interactions are identical to correlation in the neural networks means that instead of neurons that fire together, wire together, we have genes that are selected together, wire together. Uh, and that's just coming from the fact that uh, selection is in incrementally improving the fit of the phenotype to the target. It's just minimizing the error. It follows from that. OK, so we can go a little bit further with the same model. Uh, we're now interested in 
we've shown how to shape the distribution of phenotypes produced by genotype-phenotype map, but how does that affect evolvability? And what about that issue of how good a generalization does it do? Uh, well, in natural selection, there's no intrinsic reason to evolve a GP map uh, that's beneficial with respect to future environments, of course, um, especially if that interferes with the goodness of fit to the current environment. So there's a trade-off between performance now in the current environment and performance later, and that's the hard part of the evolution of evolvability. The reason that's the hard part is because that's the, the performance on the training set is easy. It's the performance on the test set that's the hard part of machine learning. Right? Evolving fit phenotypes is easy. Evolving a genotype phenotype map that's capable of anticipating phenotypes you want in the future, that's the hard bit. So overfitting uh, is a failure to generalize, and it's the result of paying too much attention to the training set. And likewise, the failure to anticipate future environments can result from the intrinsically myopic nature of natural selection. But the conditions that alleviate overfitting in machine learning are directly relevant to the conditions that enhance evolvability in evolutionary processes, such as limiting model complexity. Uh, so one of the talks earlier this week talked about how the advantage of selecting on the individual features was that you have a sort of regularization, right? So having a limited model forces you to generalize instead of overfitting. In the previous example with the loops and the stems, I deliberately picked a function that the model that I was using couldn't overfit to because the loops and the stems, if you look closely, either had one loop or three loops, which is odd parity. Right? And that's why it had, could only learn that set by generalizing to the general class. It can't represent odd parity, so it just gives me any combination of modules back. But more generally, it's not going to be that easy. Right? But things like regularization that we use in machine learning or penalizing unnecessary model, unnecessary model complexity are also relevant. And this is a, a direct parallel with uh, Jeff Klum's work on evolved modularity through adding a cost of connections. So let's do a different example. Uh, here's the class I wanted to learn. Uh, there is structure here, so pairs of bits are always the same. Here's the four training samples, the four environments I'm going to evolve it to. So it's a random subset of four from that set. And then I'm going to test whether it's capable of producing all of that class after being evolved on those ones. Well, it's capable of, of decreasing the error to zero on the ones that it's been evolved to. But if I look at the ability of the GRN to produce the whole class, it gets better at first, and then it gets worse. That's a classic overfitting uh, curve. If then I add a selective pressure for sparse networks, the ability to cope with unseen environments improves dramatically. That is, it's producing phenotypes that are from the full class. And there's only a small cost in the ability to match the environments that it was actually in. It's important that there is a cost, though, because that means that if you had a choice about whether to add that regularization cost or not, you wouldn't. Yeah? You, would, you would rather overfit. Uh, can we get from the idea of a flexible phenotype distribution that's nice and general to the idea of evolvability? So Lewis Quinos has been working on this. It's sort of clear that a memory of past the past can obviously be helpful if the future is the same as the past. But if the future is... The fact that we have generalization as well means that it could be useful even if the future is not the same as the past, but it's similar in structural ways. Uh, so here's some examples of what happens to fitness immediately after a change in environment in the two environment case. This is the speed of adaptation back to high fitness with the old, with the immature genotype phenotype map, and this is with the mature genotype phenotype map later in evolution. In other cases, there's something a little bit more interesting happens, which is it's actually slower to respond with the mature genotype phenotype map at first. This is essentially an effect of canalization, that even though the environment has changed, it's still producing the phenotypes for the old environment. But when it passes a certain threshold, it says, oh, you wanted me to do the other phenotype, then it switches rapidly to produce the other phenotype. It's, that's evolving faster, but it's not evolving better. It doesn't get to anywhere this, this guy didn't get to in the first place. Here's another Fa example. Faster isn't better. Sorry? Faster is not better. It doesn't, it doesn't find better solutions. It just gets the same solution faster. Yeah, faster is better to a biologist. It's not good. Uh, so uh, this is a different problem where instead of evolving in a, in a varying environment, I'm going to evolve it in a single multimodal environment, lots of times from different random conditions. And the environment is a locally weighted match to a target image, or, or its inverse, which is equivalent to a, local, a locally weighted max 2 sat or an Ising model that will appreciate. 
and we're evolving multiple times from random initial vectors. And at first, it gets local domains in agreement, but there are often borders or boundaries between other local domains that are in disagreement. By the way, the target image is, in case you don't recognize it, it's supposed to be a double helix. We're working on the resolution there. <laughs> Uh, so the first time we try to evolve in that fitness landscape, we find something locally optimal. The second time we evolve, we find something locally optimal, and so on. Uh, in fact, these are like 33 generations later, each one. But over time, it gets better at finding larger localized domains which are in agreement, until eventually it's able to produce either the target image or its complement reliably. Yeah. Can I just check the model? This is the evolution paper model, right? The, the no, it goes beyond that. The matrix. Is that being just randomly evolved as well as a slow rate, or is that changing my heavy and slow? No, the matrix is being evolved by random variation and selection. Mm -hmm. But at a slower, much, a slower, much slower rate than the vector, yes. So that's quite inefficient compared to the heavy and learning case. Much slower. Well, the heavy and learning case has directed change in the, in the interaction coefficients, and here we're doing random variation and selection. But if you only need to change one interaction term at a time, so uh, since that's each interaction term is a one-dimensional thing, 50% of your mutations improve it and 50% of them make it worse. So it's not much slower than doing it in a directed fashion. But the difference here is that the matrix has evolved. Yeah. It's random in the vector, but the matrix has evolved. Yeah. So uh, if we look at how the evolved network is able to evolve good phenotypes in this multimodal landscape, we find that not only is it much faster, than the uh, immature network that basically is a one-to-one -one mapping. But it also finds something that are fitter, right? It finds the global optimum of the uh, fitness landscape and not just a local optimum. And even if we run it, I said, you're going to have to run it longer than that, Lewis, because they're going to think it might get there eventually. But it is really stuck on local optima. So that's sort of interesting because it means that the evolved biases of the genotype phenotype map have hidden the fine scale details of the fitness gradients that was distracting the one-to-one -one genotype phenotype map and causing it to get stuck. And it's smoothing out the fitness landscape instead of using a generalized past experience to go straight for the goal and ignore those little distractions. So the idea of bivariate associative models being as a way of understanding genotype phenotype map helps us understand things like robust models of the selective environment, faster adaptation, and better adaptation. None of this involves multi-level selection. right? or even a population. I'm actually hill climbing uh, the uh, mutation and selection process. It's just a, a 1 plus 1 EA, if you'd like to call it that. Let's go on to the second one. This is the evolution of social ecological relationships or interspecies interactions in an ecosystem. So in the gene networks, they alter the distribution of phenotypic variation or the interactions within a single unit of selection. But in the ecological networks, there are interactions between multiple units of selection. So there's something different going on there. Um, instead of a gene network, we have an N species lock of Volterra model of non trophic uh, ecological interactions. And we're going to evolve the interaction coefficients or the community matrix that control the ecological dynamics. But we're going to evolve them by individual natural selection. There's no population of ecosystems here, uh, or even a fitness function evaluating the quality of the attractor of an ecosystem. Each species is just changing its interactions with other species to maximize its own growth rate. Uh, but we're going to put this ecosystem under varying environmental conditions. Under one environmental condition, the carrying capacities of some species are, are higher. Those species are intrinsically better suited to one environment, and other species are less suited. And in the other environment, the species that are better suited are different. The subset of species that are well suited are different, and the subset of species that are uh, not so well suited are different. So we can still represent that as two images, but these images are uh, a picture of the carrying capacities of the set of species in two different environments. They're not targets that I'm trying to evolve to. <coughs> well, what happens? Some ecological species interactions go up, some go down, some stay near zero. And the consequence of that is that ecological attractors of the Locke Volterra model are able to reproduce those two attractors from any initial conditions. Uh, we can test that they're stable. So if I give it an ecological condition, a set of species densities that's a bit similar to one of the attractors it's been uh, carrying capacity patterns it's been evolving in, in the past, it goes to that ecological attractor. And if I give it one that's a bit similar, it's quite noisy, that one, this one it goes to that one. I can also give it just some species that are part of this pattern, and it gives me the whole climax community, if you like, or some other species which are relevant, which are uh, match the first pattern, and it gives me the other pattern. 
the other climax community. And uh, just for the fun of it, uh, why don't we look at uh, the uh, response of, of the ecosystem to environmental forcing and how that changes over time. So early in time, the response of the ecosystem to environmental forcing between hot and cold is just a, a linear response. But after the species interactions have been evolving for a while at hot and a while at cold and a while at hot and a while at cold, the consequence of that is that now the ecological response has a hysteresis loop in it, which causes a uh, um, catastrophic uh, regime shift between one and the other. As I change the environmental forcing this way, it stays in the hot pattern, hot pattern, hot pattern, hot pattern, then it goes to the cold pattern, and I have to force it all the way back again this way before it would flip back. So... If you have two types that would coexist, there are many species coexisting here in each attractor. There are many in each attractor, I'm sorry. Yeah. Uh, but the set of species in one attractor doesn't coexist with the set of species in the other attractor. Um, so these ideas, the same ideas, help us understand the evolution of ecological interactions that control the distribution of ecological equilibria uh, and how that's shaped by past environmental conditions and the evolution of memory and learning behaviors influencing ecological robustness and stability and resilience and regime shifts. That means that there's an organized interaction network structure and holistic behaviors without any multi-level selection going on in the ecosystem. Okay, so those two models seem like they do basically the same thing, right? They seem like they're just basically both hot field networks in disguise. What's the difference between the two? Well, in the gene networks, the interactions are within a single unit of selection, and selection is acting on the attractor of the whole system. Whereas in the ecological networks, selection is acting on individual species to maximize their individual growth. Uh, so there's no selection for a particular pattern, regardless of how many T's it has. There's selection merely to dwell on the, the pattern that the ecosystem is already forced to, right? So the ecosystem is forced to a particular pattern by the environmental conditions and the effect of the evolution of the interactions between the species is just to canalize that pattern. So the attractor of the ecological network isn't a good attractor, it's just that the <coughs> ecosystem is remembering it because, it's not remembering it because it's good, it's just a memory of where it's been, right? Well, that's the difference between supervised and unsupervised learning, isn't it? So in supervised learning, that reinforces correlations that are good. When you do selection on the whole system, we're selecting for a specific target and the correlations that match that target better are the correlations that evolve. But in unsupervised learning, that just reinforces correlations that are frequent, not correlations that are good. They're correlations that are already there in the data, independent <coughs> of what you want to do with them. Uh, so selection on the parts, on the individual species, is equivalent to selection that has the effect of reinforcing what the system was already doing, regardless of whether that was good or bad. There's nothing about this system that would enable the ecosystem to uh, produce the combination of species which was good, right? It's just producing the combination of species that it's been forced to in the past. Does, does good mean anything? You're saying good doesn't, it doesn't mean for the ecosystem. Context. Context. It doesn't for the ecosystem, yeah, yeah. right? Because the ecosystem doesn't have any fitness. That's but, the point. But the, there's presumably a good under, but it doesn't collapse yeah. as you change the environment. Yeah. Uh, so well, it's the thing that's being selected for is that each species maximizes its own growth rate. That has the side effect of producing a network of species which uh, have a particular structure of interactions with one another that is robust. Because I, I wasn't selecting for that, it's a side effect of selecting for uh, maximum growth. I, I don't think that's supervised learning, I think that's reinforcement learning. Because you're not being supervised learning when you're given the right answer. In all its detail. Mm -hmm. if, you're, if you're reinforcing, you're giving one, one bit of feedback, one, one a scale of feedback, that's reinforcement learning. Yes, okay. Yeah, that might be right. Thanks. Uh, so system level selection, we're not surprised it gives us system level adaptation. When I evolve a gene network to give us good phenotypes, it does. But when I select on the parts, that makes the parts adapted, the species are quite happy, but it gives us system level robustness. What's the relationship between system level robustness coming from selection on the parts and system level adaptation that we would normally expect to see from selection on the whole? Well, that's the same as what's the relationship between unsupervised and supervised learning. Uh, well, we know that unsupervised learning can guide supervised learning. Unsupervised learning reduces the dimensionality of the data, builds a lower dimensional model of the data. It can be used to reduce the dimensionality of a supervised learning task, such that unsupervised learning primes good performance at supervised learning tasks. And the combination of unsupervised and supervised learning is useful in learning high dimensional or deep models if the amount of labeled data is limited. Or put another way, robust lower dimensional models of data are useful for finding good models at the next level up. Uh, 
So that brings us to deep learning, or deep belief networks, which work like this. So this is a type of neural network where you add layers to the network incrementally. So we learn one layer of associations with a restricted Boltzmann machine with unsupervised learning. That's just correlation learning. And then we freeze it, and then we put another layer on the network and we learn correlations among those. Uh, that's received a lot of attention recently in the machine learning community. Works pretty well. Uh, each layer is only learning a pairwise model, which makes each layer quite tractable to learn. But there's an interesting question here. How can the first layer of the network be useful for the next layer of the network that you haven't even started yet? Does the first layer of the network have foresight of what you're going to do in the next layer of the network? Well, no, because all the first layer of the network is doing is reducing the dimensionality of the data, which is a good heuristic regardless of what you want to do in the next level. Uh, uh, which is another way of saying regularization improves generalization. So the analogy I want to make is that the major transitions in evolution can be thought of as an analog of deep evolution with an analog of deep learning. So individual selection acting on the relationships between multiple units of selection modifies the ecological attractors, reinforces correlations that are frequent. Then a change in the reproductive unit freezes those solutions, and then selection can now respond to competition between those phenotypes, selection for good combinations of individuals, and not just frequent combinations of equilibriums. So instead of just going to the nearest equilibrium and freezing it, we are able to do competition between equilibrium or equilibrium selection. But how do we do that freezing? That's where we need the third model. So now we're going to talk about uh, traits that affect the reproductive unit uh, or changes in the evolutionary unit. We've seen interactions within a unit, we've seen interactions between units. How about the level of evolutionary unit changes over evolutionary time or change the definition of self and other? Uh, well, how could you do that? Well, here's one uh, method of inheritance. This is a migrant pool aggregation and dispersal model of inheritance. So you have a lot of particles in different groups, but when the groups are uh, only reproduced by the particles, uh, entering a migrant pool and then reforming or aggregating into different groups. Although these groups might be different and some groups might be better than others because of their differences, the differences between groups are not heritable into the next population of groups. It's returned to linkage equilibrium. A different model of inheritance is a vertical model of inheritance where groups fission and this is interesting because it means that the, some groups might be better than others because of the combinations of particles that they have and when they fission the differences between groups are heritable. So the first model is sometimes called a type 1 group selection, and the second one is called type 2 group selection, or MLS1 and MLS2. They're basically the difference between horizontal transmission and vertical transmission of the heritable particles. Uh, we could be talking about genes in an organism, or multiple organisms with uh, multiple self-replicating molecules within a, a compartment, or multiple organisms within a host, and whether they're transferred vertically or horizontally. So group selection is explicit in the second case where you have a group fissioning process. The groups have uh, the differences between groups are heritable, and that means you have a you know a, a stronger ability to respond to selection at the group level if you have the uh, heritability of the group variants. But what if organisms had traits that change the mode of reproduction from horizontal to vertical reproduction? What sort of traits could do that? Well, the evolution of membranes that change a population from being freely mixed to spatial to compartmentalized or the evolution of recombination rate, or more interestingly, the evolution of the genetic map that changes things from recombining freely to being genetically linked. Uh, or the evolution of uh, symbiotic um, uh, um, relationships that change from being co-evolution to being endosymbiosis, where a parasite is transmitted vertically. So uh, here we can start off with a migrant pool model, but allow particles to evolve things that make them stick together selectively. Uh, so I'm just going to say, uh, uh, this is work by um, my student Adam Jackson, um, that an evolutionary change forms a new partnership at random. It takes two little things that used to replicate independently and just put them together at random. Uh, a group means that two individuals are thereafter treated as a single unit. It's like the handcuffs uh, that Manfred was talking about yesterday. I assume that the ecological dynamics are faster than the evolutionary dynamics, so you make handcuffs and break handcuffs slowly, but the ecological dynamics are fast, same separation of time scales as before. And the ecological population dynamics has multiple equilibria uh, that are generated from a modular weighted coordination game. And I know that if you found the right group structure that corresponded to that modular weighted coordination game, it would make solving those constraints easy. But is that the structure that individual selection finds? No, it's not. Uh, what happens if you let them make handcuffs with one another is that 
It goes to a local ecological equilibrium, and then everybody that's there just makes handcuffs with everybody. So that's not what I wanted. That doesn't do anything interesting. It does change the unit of selection from individuals to grand coalitions in game theoretic form, directly from individuals to grand coalitions. But that doesn't change the ability of the system uh, to evolve in any interesting way. Or what if I keep the ecological uh, system, the ecological population dynamics out of equilibrium? Which handcuffs form then? I wasn't going to use the handcuffs metaphor until yesterday. Uh, well, they still make lots of handcuffs, but then the, the pattern of handcuffing that they do is um, much more random. But if I perturb the ecological dynamics occasionally so that it spends most of its time at ecological equilibria, but at a distribution of ecological equilibria over time, something more interesting happens, which is that particular groups of species form handcuffs with one another, but not with everybody. And those groups are the right groups uh, that correspond to the modular coordination game that I knew was there. So what are the selective pressures on, form, on forming those groups? Well, at any equilibrium, there are many partnerships that are bad. If you try to form a partnership with a species that's not present at that equilibrium, that would be bad because they're selected against. You don't want to have a partnership with somebody that's already selected against. There are none that are good. Right? There are no single partnerships you could evolve that would enable you to get out of that equilibrium because if there was, that single partner could have invaded and it would mean it wasn't an equilibrium. But there are, amongst the ones that are not bad, there are some that, sorry, amongst the ones that are not good, there are some that are bad and some that are neutral. And that distinction is important. So the ones that are neutral, some of the ones that are neutral in, uh, that are neutral in one selective environment, some of those will be neutral in many ecological conditions, and some of them will be neutral in only a few. But selection is basically retaining the most reliably neutral ones, the most reliably robust ones, or non-deleterious partnerships. It's selection for robustness, not individual fitness advantage, that's causing those partnerships to evolve. The symbiotic partnerships that evolve are heavy and again, species that <coughs> cover her together, wire together. Uh, but does the encapsulation of subgroups from the ecological attractors into new evolution units do anything other than find the structure that I put there, right? It was motivated by selection for responding to robustness, but does it produce new high-level units that are good, that increase the amount of cooperation rather than just canalizing the cooperation you already had? So here's what happens when you don't have the evolution of partnerships. Uh, some of those little uh, compartments are evolving towards uh, attractors that have a high number of cooperators and some to a low number of cooperators because individual selection doesn't care about whether you go to the good attractor or the bad attractor. And if you don't allow it to evolve uh, uh, partnerships with one another, they just stay there. They can never get out of those attractors. That's why they're called attractors. But if you wait long enough, uh, those partnerships that are robust or reliably non-deleterious evolve. And those partnerships are actually the right partnerships for combinations of species to be able to leap from one attractor to another. So that when they go from one uh, pool to another pool, they take the right species with them so that they can get out of that equilibrium and all invade together. So no one of them could evade individually, which was why it was an equilibrium, but together they can, and they found the right partners to do that. So that long period of apparent neutral evolution is not doing nothing. It's evolving structural relationships between components will have the consequences of the future evolution. But that, that couldn't have been the reason that it did it, right? It couldn't have been evolving those partnerships because in the future they were going to be good, right? It was evolving those partnerships because at the time they increased robustness. So you can take those principles and throw away all of the evolutionary components and just make an algorithm that works. Uh, so this paper accepted this year, this month, uh, shows that uh, in a simple hierarchically modular problem, a sort of hierarchicalizing model, it takes exponential time for other kinds of evolutionary algorithms, but it's solved in polynomial time. And it has no a priori information about the structure of the linkage, which problem variables are dependent on which other problem variables. And you don't have to know how to make the hierarchy. That's right. You don't have to be clever on that. Sorry? You don't have to be clever on how you do the hierarchy. You. The algorithm has to figure out what the hierarchy okay. is, but I don't tell it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so where are we at? How can we make sense of these three models together? Well, all three models are, if you like, about modifier alleles that alter correlations in some way. 
They are the evolution of alleles that alter the correlations among phenotypic traits, or the evolution of alleles that alter the correlations among selective pressures, or the evolution of correlations that alter genetic inheritance. But if it was just a single modifier allele, none of these models would be interesting, because a single modifier allele can't hold much information about the past. A network of modifier alleles can hold a lot of information about the past, and that's why it gives more interesting results. Now, in all three cases, the reason that they evolve for, what well, the thing that they evolve for, it's selection for a direct selective benefit, that regulatory interactions improve individual fitness, or species interactions improve individual species growth, or symbiotic partnerships that are reliably non-deleterious. But the effect of those things, in each case, is to cause the selection of an associative model. Now, I wasn't selecting for an associative model, but I got an associative model. <coughs> so it's an associative model of previously selected phenotypes, uh, um, reinforcing good associations, or an associative model of past ecological states, reinforcing common associations, or an associative model of past ecological states, which changes us, uh, the subset of common associations, enables us to select, select between the subset of associations that are um, stable to find the associations that are good. Why does selection for fit phenotypes produce selection uh, of an associative model of fit phenotypes? Well, it's not mysterious, right? The only way to reduce the error between the actual output of a model and the desired output of a model is to make the model fit the data better. And if the model space is constrained to be low order, for example, associative, it'll have to be a generalized representation of the data. Not because generalization is being rewarded explicitly, but because your model space is limited. Our natural model space is limited in ways that force useful generalization, a sort of necessary side effect is useful generalization. Well, associative models are the minimal departure from a univariate model, which can't represent any structure at all. And although biological systems in some cases could represent more than pairwise correlations, there's always going to be a stronger selective signal for correlations that are uh, that are pairwise than for higher order terms, just because the signal for higher order terms is going to be much rarer. There is, of course, an even stronger selection for the univariate terms, but when the univariate terms are exhausted, the pairs are next. And after you've canalized the pairs, the meta pairs are next. I guess I don't understand the argument as to why higher order things can't be at least as strong. I mean, you sort of have some perturbative extra mind. It's just, you, just because you're going to see them more rarely, right? So there could be there could be a signal that particular combinations of genes, for example, particular combinations of alleles are, are extremely fit, right? So they could be very important for fitness. But your ability to sample those combinations is, is well, very that's limited. That's your ability to see them, not, whether, not how they develop. Uh, if you can't see them, they're not going to evolve. So the things that you can see are going to be the correlation, uh, are going to be the... No, because you don't know which ones to look at. So there can be higher order ones there, which are very hard to find, because there are a huge number of possible higher order ones. Yes. Not clear okay, so if you wanted to build, if you wanted to jump in at the top, and let's say I want to build five way, uh, an order five model, right? So there might be order five dependencies in my fitness landscape that I could exploit if I could see those, but it's going to be very difficult for me to find them because the number of possible models is, is growing exponentially with the order of the model. But the number of possible five fold combinations is also growing exponentially. But my ability to sample them isn't. It doesn't matter. Your ability to sample them is irrelevant. Well, if I, have the, if I have a model that represents the wrong order five correlations, I won't be able to see the order five correlations I, that I could have selected on. The, the question is, like, what fraction of the potential order five combinations actually are there? Yeah, so what, how, how does the, the, the fr fraction that are good fall off with the... Uh, yeah. yeah, you're right. I'm making some, you're battling like like entropy and energy life arguments. And yeah. I think the... But I think it's so another crucial thing for looking GWAS and so on, right? Is the difficulty of looking, finding correlations, and the question, the crucial one, the question whether they're there. Uh, yeah. Okay. Uh, so I'm arguing that uh, the the ability to respond to pairwise associations is much stronger than the ability to respond to higher order correlations because they are more common. Yes. And the model space you have to search in is smaller. But that's why hierarchical associative models, deep learning neural networks, that's why they're powerful, and that's why they're good in machine learning. It's not a mysterious uh, observation that uh, hierarchical pairwise models are good. So let's conclude. The Winnie machine 
learns not just by changing the products of evolution, it's not just the products of evolution that have information about selective history, but by changing the mechanisms of evolution. And none of the components of the Darwinian machine are fixed. And machine learning concepts can help us understand how the variation distribution changes, how the selective pressures change, how the reproductive mechanisms change, and how they work together in the evolutionary transitions. I think the main analogy that I want to make for understanding the evolutionary transitions is the analogy between deep learning and deep evolution, that simple principles of correlation learning can be used to reduce the dimensionality of the space explored, encapsulate the variables into emergent high-level variables, and then the process can recurse. And a rescalable Darwinian machine has different optimization capabilities to a fixed machine. Different, certainly. Better, for the same reason that deep learning has better ability to learn high-level representations. In principle, the, the heuristic that you're exploiting is get everything you can from a simple model before moving on to a higher order model. Uh, evolution, I'm claiming then, is an adaptive process that improves its ability to adapt with experience. An algorithm that learns how to learn is a type of learning algorithm. And that means that the evolution of probability is still evolution. So it's easy to get those two things confused, right? Uh, but the question that you ask if you think about it is, well, it's all just uh, evolution, is you'd ask what different mechanisms and model spaces are, they correspond to different learning algorithms, so which one is biology using? But if you're interested in how evolution improves its ability to adapt with experience, then you want to ask what sort of model space allows movement in the space of Darwinian machines? And the models that I've shown you are supposed to give examples of traits that are evolvable that can move in that space and the conditions where they do. So I think that all of that process is exactly as mysterious as the fact that generalization is possible in machine learning. Now, in general, generalization isn't possible in machine learning because I could give you a training set and then I could give you a test set that's nothing to do with it, right? But so long as we want to make any weak assumptions about uh, the structure of the training set being related to the structure of the test set, that makes generalization possible. Uh, so the ability of, every, of the Darwinian machine to rescale itself is exactly as mysterious as the, the, cape, the fact that generalization is possible in machine learning, but it's no more mysterious than that. Uh, and I want to give thanks to all those people that have helped with that work. Thank you. So in, when I'm evolving a gene network and I'm evolving it to produce an output that, that is fit, it's like I'm doing supervised learning, right? Give me the correlations that improve the output. Uh, that's definitely not supervised learning. Okay. <laughs> supervised learning is when you're actually making directed changes based on uh, the specific, based on knowledge of the actual answer. Now, Rather than knowledge of the direction learning, of the answer. Yeah, reinforcement yeah. learning, you get a positive or negative feedback on whether the change was good or bad. Mm. Right? Supervised learning, you're told the, the full details of the right answer. So, yeah, okay. I don't think you mean supervised learning. Yeah, maybe I don't. Helpful learning. Sorry? Helpful learning. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, so, in your model, you didn't, you didn't have. Uh, uh, Recombination was, uh, it, it seemed to have just mutation. Um, in the gene network, there's no recombination. In the species model, each species is atomic, there's no recombination. In the last model, it's effectively changing from something which has free recombination to something that doesn't. Okay. Uh, let's say you start with uh, something that has uh, free, free recombination. Yeah. Because, uh, could, could like fixation be one of the, the freezing mechanisms? So the trouble with that is that it's this issue of, uh, if, I, if I put a chair in the corner of the room, the chair remembers the position where I put it, right? It's, a, it's, a, it's only memory in a, in a degenerate sense. It's only memory that can only remember one thing at a time, right? What we need is a memory that's structural, uh, that's about hidden variables and not about the surface variables. If it's about the surface, if it's memory in the surface variables, you can only remember one thing. If I ask you to remember a second thing, you have to move the surface variables over to the second thing. 
But if you have hidden variables which represent structural relationships between those surface variables, they can represent a memory that enables you to move the surface variables freely. I still have variability in all of my alleles, but I've still learned something about phenotypes that are good. Right. So I'm not saying fixation. I'm not saying convergence you know, of all, all alleles. I'm saying convergence of a particular set of uh, the fixation of just a set of alleles. Yeah, but you don't um, want to remove variation from any of your alleles. Right? You still want the alleles to be variable, otherwise there's nothing left to do at the next level of organization. Well, there's, there's the rest. I mean, you've reduced the dimensionality, and there's the... Yeah, but only in a sequential fixation sort of way, right? Mm -hmm. So that's not a hierarchical process. That's an iterative <coughs> process of sequential fixation, right? which is an interesting thing to do, but it doesn't enable you to produce a recursive process. If you want a recursive process, where you started off with variable bits, uh, you want later to have variable modules. But there has to be more than one solution to each module, otherwise you can't search combinations of modules. There's no point searching combinations of things if each thing only has one solution. Right? If they're fixed. So you still want variability within each of your subsystems, but you want that variability to be constrained uh, and not free, otherwise you haven't learned anything. So to be the next Darwin, you've got to do some, you've got to fit this to some date, right? <laughs> Uh-huh. How are you going to do that? I didn't ask you that in your talk. <laughs> <laughs> I, would have, I, I would have answered. <laughs> uh, okay, so uh, there is biological evidence for uh, what are called quantitative relational traits, relational quantitative traits, sorry, for, that Michaela Pavlikov and Gunter have studied, uh, which show that there are traits that modify the correlations between two other traits. And it's easy, it's, it's, there exist theoretical models that show that the selective pressures on those relational traits should follow the principles of Hebb's rule, although they didn't name it as Hebb's rule. Uh, so if, you were, if you're able to measure those relational traits and the frequency of those relational traits in the population, then you should be able to show that, that correlated selection on the traits that produces that result. Right? Uh, however, that wouldn't produce an integrated system of sort of information integration across the genome, if that's what you're looking for, right? If it's just a single trait that controls the correlation between two others. And although you, there could be many of those, it only really gets interesting when there's nonlinear recurrence, right? Because then the information can spread across the network in, a, in an interesting way. Otherwise, you just to sort of have a superposition of pairwise things, pairwise things going on. That would be, that would be more difficult. But I don't see why, in principle, uh, you couldn't. Uh, do exactly the experiment that I've done in simulation. So you evolve for a particular gene expression pattern, you evolve for another particular gene expression pattern, and then you examine the distribution of phenotypic uh, uh, expression pattern equilibria that you get from the system. Uh, 